almost 30. Is it that time? Good afternoon. <laughs> yep. Got lost there for a minute. Uh, welcome to the last of the Brown Bag Lunch interviews. Um, we have a photographer here today from the Burlington Free Press. Did I get that right? Uh, Vermont Arts Council. Vermont Arts Council. Even better. From the Vermont Arts Council, yeah. who are funded for this festival. So uh, he simply asked permission that he uh, uh, be able to take photos. Does uh, anybody have a problem? We have some black puppeteer masks. If you really don't want to be in the news. No, it's okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll take that as a yes. Good. Um, we'd like to start with an art burst. And uh, do you want to just tell them about this? Yes. And I will say no more. We couldn't decide who should introduce whom. Because we're both in it. Um, so we'll introduce each other, and I'll introduce him after he introduces us. Um, so Sherry Valeska and I did the same glass puppetry training last summer together, and this is a two-week intensive. Do you guys want to say something about the process? Yeah. Uh, it, we all brought articles that interested us, and then we were given guidelines of how we could create the actual piece. And some of those guidelines were how many lines we could take out of the article. Um, that, it, that there had to be a look back. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember what the other ones were? I think those are the two that and the actual text. And then we made the show mostly um, after class because we had instruction with Eric and Ines during the day and then we worked on the piece and presented it once to each other, got some feedback, and then presented it one more time. And everything was created. So we've been holding on to this for a year. So um, <laughs> you know what, what time does to cardboard and uh, papers. <coughs> um, yes, there we go. Yeah, yeah we're ready. Enjoy. Thank <laughs> you. 
immigration crisis on the U.S. border isn't just about money. Far from it. But it does force a critical question. Does the influx of unaccompanied alien children contribute more money to the U.S. economy than it takes out? Boom or bust? The state is seeking five million in reimbursements for a decade of spending. The Senate is offering 2.7 billion and the House 1.5 million. Border operations cost 1.3 million a week. 1,000 National Guard troops reported price tag 12 million a month. 57 million undocumented children. Church, you going to say something? Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
It gives me great pleasure to introduce Eric Bass and Roberto Solomon and John Potter to talk today about their collaboration. And I'll let them say more. Thank you for being here. We still have uh, one more show of El Patico Feo at Hilltop at 3 o'clock, and then tonight Romeo and Juliet at NEYT at 8. Last chance. So good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as you heard, my name is John Potter. Um, I'm the former arts editor of the Brattleboro Reformer, now the executive director of the Latches, and very uh, pleased and honored to be asked by Sandglass to help facilitate these conversations. Uh, with me today is Eric Bass of Sandglass Theater and Roberto Salomon of And we'll talk about their um, uh, collaboration there. Uh, but to give you some context, um, El Salvador right now has been called the world's most homicidal country. Uh, they are averaging 30 murders a day. And uh, to put that into some context, and how we would feel about that, that's the level of violence. Uh, 20 times more uh, violent and deadly than the United States as a basis of population. As someone said, this country is bleeding and it urgently needs a tourniquet. And I don't know if uh, Eric and Roberto consider themselves the tourniquet, we'll find that out. But we're here to talk about uh, their collaboration in the context uh, in which it occurred. So, um, piece um, you guys have been working on. <laughs> We've been working uh, for um, good number of years. I uh, started my collaboration with Sandglass about 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, we've always been talking about doing a project together in Salvador. And uh, well, we've with mixing actors and puppets and which ones can't and why they can and why they can't. And uh, we both uh, like Nathan the Wise by Lessing the 18th century German playwright very much. And uh, we finally decided that this was what we, what we were going to go on. And we started putting this project together, which took uh, the association between Sandglass Theater and Teatro Lispoma with, with uh, a lot of grants in between. Uh, we were able to do this project with actors over a period of a year and a half. And uh, first it started with a, with a workshop in which we invited 15 actors to participate. And uh, it was a training, a training program to be able to with puppets the way uh, we had designed the show to be. And um, then we directed it uh, with the help of Ines, uh, who did the puppets. and and contributed greatly to the, um, to the training in, in Let's React. And after this uh, period of training, which was about three weeks, we, um, we chose seven actors out of the 15 and uh, then started the rehearsal periods in an And we staged this. Uh, we started staging this and then stopped for six months, uh, six months about, yes, and then they came back to South. We also continued to the rehearsals and then we just presented the show uh, last month <coughs> in El Salvador and the, uh, the effect has been very, very positive and it's been very well received and it's a play that talks uh, basically at tolerance, but it talks about a lot more things that have to do with El Salvador and, um, and that uh, really touched the audience and, uh, and really f felt like we were El Salvador with the intolerance and the murder rate and whatnot. 
But other than that, it's still a beautiful country, and our blue lake has just turned turquoise last week, so that's mm -hmm. a nice news, too. So I like to give nice news about countries. Okay, now. Mm. Where are the murders? I, I should add Scott Ainsley, a uh, local uh, wonderful blues musician, also a very good theater composer, came down with us to Salvador to create the score for this piece. It's a wonderful score. And I, and I might say just a word about the relationship between the actors and the puppets, that um, the story takes place during the and, uh, and we made the decision to let the puppets be costumed. And so what did we do with the actors? So we made the decision to costume the actors as if they came from different classes of contemporary um, Salvadoran society. Uh, and by doing that, we created a fiction that we, we don't talk about in the play, but it's as if seven people from different classes of Salvadoran society, a maid, a politician, a gang member, a business, to do something that they don't do, come together and do a play about uh, racial and religious intolerance. And uh, it's, the play begins, you'll see it when we show a little video, it begins with them presenting themselves and ends with them presenting themselves. And one of the, uh, God, one of the was uh, someone in the audience who said, how can you have a maid on stage? And how can you let her manipulate the puppet of the, the sister of a sultan? And uh, you, you know, I mean, the, the class stuff was... Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Absolutely, Sorry. except it was a third crusade. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, Eric, you could delve a little deeper into the play, Nathan, the wine. themes um, sure. are, are come sure. to light. Um, Lessing, uh, Lessing was a, uh, perhaps the, the great uh, spokesman for the German Enlightenment in the late 1700s and a great friend of Moses Met Voltaire, there you go, uh, philosophers, uh, writers. Um, You've, you've derailed me. <laughs> Is that there, the, Muslims, Christians, Jews are all represented in the play as, as they were, of course, in this place and time. Um, and they were, in this place and time, essentially enemies. Nathan the Wise, the actual plot of the play is one in which everyone surprises himself by rescuing his enemy and then can't, can't deal with the emotions of having done that. It's, it's utterly brilliant. And being rescued by their enemy also. Yes, yes. You know, the we do a two-person number here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're bringing out that strategy. Yeah, so the Templar, for instance, is about to be executed by the Sultan. And the Sultan looks at his face and sees in it the face of his own lost brother and spares his life. The Templar then runs out into the world almost deranged from having been spared from being beheaded, sees a fire, rushes into this house on fire, and rescues a young Jewish woman, a Jew his sworn enemy. So in the Templar al alone is this, is this battle of being both rescuer and rescued by his enemies. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's basic, basically that's the battlefield of this piece. And the Jewish girl is Nathan the Wise's daughter and Nathan is a merchant and uh, Saladin needs money for his, uh, War. for his wars. 
and uh, Nathan has just loaded with uh, with goods and has a lot of money and doesn't know where to place it, so he becomes Nathan's money lender. So everybody owes something to somebody, and everybody is is um, is owing something. Eric, when we talked, um, it struck me that um, the transformative moments um, for these people occurred through their actions rather than them receiving instructed, um, but it was through action. And I just, I've just found that an interesting, um, mm -hmm. interesting approach. And we also talked about how um, is tolerance the right word uh, for what happens? Uh, maybe you could could yes, ruminate on that a little bit. You don't know this, but we, we had we had a um, enlightening. <laughs> yes, no, no, we had a, we had a, um, uh, a in Salvador after one of the performances in which we invited uh, the interreligious uh, conference of Salvador. Uh, where there's an imam, a uh, couple of uh, evangelists, a Catholic priest, a rabbi, and a Buddhist. And, um, and strangely enough, it's the Buddhist that runs it. <laughs> Not strange at all. Anyway, <laughs> it's this very ecumenical group, and they came to a performance, and we after the show, and uh, it was interesting that, the, um, that one of the themes that came out precisely what was you were just talking about is tolerance, because the rabbi brought up that, that he was very offended by this word tolerance, because he said it's not really a play about tolerance, because tolerance means that you're better than the other one whose mm -hmm. presence you're tolerating. Mm -hmm. So uh, we thought that was interesting and uh, really shed light on, on what we were doing. Yeah, and I think I think you know it's it's uh, I think here it's kind of a '60s term, and I, and I think that that no, it's no longer well received, hmm. as as uh, it doesn't say what we mean. Yeah. 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 Do you have a word for what you mean? No. <laughs> uh, engagement. Um, solidarity. Solidarity. Could, could you shed some light on um, what's causing the conditions in El Salvador? And, and then maybe moving into what it's like to create. Well, the, um, the main thing is the, uh, the historical uh, unjust distribution of wealth mm -hmm. in Salvador. But uh, let's say that if the United States uh, legalized drugs, that would end uh, But then, of course, uh, um, and if the arms sales are stopped, that would help a lot, too. So, I mean, what this is, is, is it's, it's since, uh, since, the, um, since the Cold War era, Central America has been in the eye of the hurricane as, to, as a center of, of war commerce and which later became drugs. And uh, w Salvador is more dangerous now than it was during the war, during the Civil War. And, um, and th th what happened is that the, uh, the gangs, which you all know about, right, I imagine, I don't need. Six, six and over 600,000 people depending on the extortions of the gangs. Uh, so uh, when they, when people say get rid of the gangs, I mean, you know, there there are articles in the papers saying, you know, well, what they did in Honduras, why don't we do that? Which is basically putting a hundred gang members in an airplane and then crashing that airplane into a prison where there are another couple of hundred gang members. I mean, this is one of the solutions. But uh, of course, when you see the when you see the jails. And, and the way these jails that are designed for 200 people and have 900 people in them or 2,000 people in them, you just wonder about how, how do you get out of this? How, how do you get out of this? I mean, I, I don't have an answer. But, but mainly the, uh, the, the, the problem is there is also a very big 
other countries. It does not exist in Nicaragua or in Costa Rica or in Panama, nor in Guatemala for very different reasons. But this exists in Salvador and Honduras, which is class hatred. There is a, a, an exacerbated situation of class hatred in Salvador, which is not logical, actually, uh, that it doesn't exist in other countries. Well, uh, Costa Rica solved the problem years ago in which they simply killed all the local population. Guatemala is a, is a whole racist problem. It's not, it's not a class problem. It's a race problem. Uh, with its indigenous po population. But Salvador has this uh, extraordinary thing of, of, of this really very, very strong, strong class hatred which can't be taken out of by the root. For well, clearly you, you um, put that um, in, in your production, uh, an examination of, the cl of class. Um, well, I don't think you can do this otherwise. When I started doing theater in Salvador, uh, one of the directors in the late 60s called me over when I came in with my cast uh, to the National <coughs> Theater, and he said, you're really going to do theater with this bunch of Indians? Because, you know, uh, before that, before the late 60s, sort of a little taller and a little blonder and a little whiter. What, um, was it a hard decision um, to, to talk about costuming the actors uh, in various classes and or, or at what point did that enter the conversation? Yes, it was a very hard decision because I was against it at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. No. Part of that is um, that theater as a vehicle for social change in the United States is in a very different position from theater as a vehicle for social change in Salvador. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that what constitutes, uh, what, which, which aspects of theater constitute social change uh, in these two countries is different. And, and in the team has a lot to do with it, mm. right? I mean, as well as casting and so forth and so on. But, you, you know, if we're trying to raise money for this production and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a good part of the money that enabled us to do that came, very thankfully, from National Performance Network, uh, theater Communications Group, uh, Private Family Foundation. So a good part of it was raised here, not all of it. Uh, on some of the work. And that meant writing grant applications, and that meant uh, being very clear in the grant applications uh, why, you know, why this project, you, you know, I mean, we weren't, we weren't just a bunch of American missionaries going out to do Oklahoma. It was this play with this people in this configuration in that place and articulating that I think also helped us understand what the, you, you know, this is the beautiful thing about writing grants is that sometimes it's as you're writing the grants that you discover what you really want the production to be. It's not, it's, it, it, there's, this is a very nice dynamic sometimes. And, um, it was very clear to me that this needed to be a play, a play about Salvador. And, uh, and it certainly wasn't written about Salvador. You know, so what are the choices? You know, are we going to costume the puppets and give everybody a kind of a contemporary Salvadoran way of speaking, you know, or there's um, in the puppets, which is a natural place to go in puppet theater. And, and so the way to address this really, uh, really happened in how we used uh, that relationship to help us uh, create that part of the world which was Salvador, and then Salvador's relationship to doing this classic piece. Hmm. So that, 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 that discussion and approach then, I think, than what you first envisioned, and uh, and and our discussions kind of led us to 
uh, to work that out. And then once we had that, who were these people? What do they have? And certainly Roberto brought to this, this conversation a, a really different perspective than, than some of the stereotypes that I had about uh, how these costumes are going to be read in the context of, uh, of the Salvadoran audience. And there's another element I think that is important to, uh, to point out is that in the translation, Eric did a, uh, a translation in verse in a, in, in a sort of an 18th century English also using uh, inverted terms that we don't use anymore and, and uh, a well, very- I used a translation, I adapted one, yeah. You, but you adapted it, yes. Yeah. And, um, and d working on this translation, which I did into Spanish in verse, to use as, mu as many terms possible as were terms that, that, that would ring a bell in, Salvador in a Salvadoran ear today, which is like, you know, there's been a truce between the government and, uh, and the gangs, so what Saladin has with the, uh, with the Templars is a truce. It's not uh, a, a stopping of war like, don't speak and um, so all these kind all these these terms that all of a sudden brought the play back to life like uh, or brought the play to today in Salvador like at one point at one point uh, the Sultan's emissary asks Nathan where is the money and uh, and uh, we uh, we said where are the bags and this in Salvador is immediately recognized because our ex-president is in, uh, how do you say when you're in jail in your own home? Um, in house arrest. Uh, from Taiwan, and it's, it's called the bag issue because it's money, it's money bags, uh, right? <laughs> so so uh, all this is very important to me anyway uh, and to us generally is to have the, the play resonate in the ear of the spectator who's watching it today, which is something that I'm always blessed with because I'm always working in translations. So um, translation allows that. <laughs> do, do you feel that, um, maybe it's too early to tell, do you feel that it's making a difference or how, how will the play make a difference? Uh, no, I... ...in the world. I really don't. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we can make people more sensitive, but I don't really think, I think that, you know, I'm going to be 70 this year, so I stopped thinking that we can change the world with theater. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, there have but been we can some, contribute to it. <laughs> there have been some nice repercussions. We got uh, um, one of the nicest reviews that came out, uh, Ines and I were still down there uh, on the first weekend that the show opened for its initial three see some of those uh, first reviews and one of the ones uh, one of the ones that Roberto showed us came not from a theater critic but from a political columnist uh, a leftist political comment col column place of such violence this production is a breath of fresh air did I get that right yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh, and he's a writer's columnist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. Okay. So, so um, you know, so comments like uh, uh, as a manipulator of a royal figure. I mean, just. Uh, I mean, what what can you do? You can create some kind of. Uh, you know, you can throw a pebble in the stream and. You can do little shockwaves. Hope that there's shockwaves. There you are, you know. We have, we have a 10 minute. I was going to say this might be a good time. Is this a good time? Can we run that? Yeah. Um, somebody turning that on? This will give you, a, a, it's just excerpts. And just give you an idea of the staging and how this feels. It's a cast of seven.
starts in dark times. <laughs> <laughs> So let's take another question. <laughs> Michelle? Roberto, what was your initial um, reticence to have the costumes in the way that you finally agreed to do? What was your initial the, reticence to it? Well, it's not a coincidence that uh, Eric has talked a lot about the maid, because that was the one that was clear. Uh, the others weren't clear because I really don't know what a gang member looks like today. I mean, I live that every day when I'm going home in my car and wondering, gee, I wonder if that's a gang member on the corner there. And I wonder if that person coming towards my car is going to pull out a gun. Can, can I tell a little story about uh, that? Yeah. And uh, the, just for one second. And, but the, um, uh, you know, the, the, to me it was difficult to have some clear iconography as to, the, uh, as to how to dress them. It's one of the most difficult shows I've had to dress uh, because of that. We, we were on the beach one day. We had a day off, and we went, we went to this beautiful beach. And um, one of Roberto's uh, friends on the beach uh, was standing and talking. A group of people, Nara, was there. For anyone who hasn't met Nara Salomon, Roberto's wife, and she also plays uh, Nathan in, in the show. You'll see her on the screen momentarily. And we're standing there, and five young men pass us on the beach. In Simpson. He says, um, he says uh, you know, young men passing on the beach. There were five young men passing on the beach, and now you immediately think, am I about to get robbed? Is this, is this, is this a gang, you know? So, are we ready? Yeah. No. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question, Michelle. What's that? I don't know if I answered your question. No, I think you did, yeah. I Defining an aesthetic approach that was flexible and broad enough so that you would not be too specific in your delineation of meaning so that they would be echoes and reverberations. Yeah, but it's very difficult. It's uh, try to keep away from, from uh, you know, in this kind of production also, you just the, the Chinese slippers with the black leotards. Yeah. You know, b because this is, uh, this is. What I thought. But and, and then and then of course the the we were limited to taking seven actors because we want to travel with the play and anything over seven I mean seven is already a very big group to move around but anything over seven is is just completely out of the question. The fact that 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 uh, the one who plays the maid is plays the princess so how do you do you change costumes? Do you do you not? How do how do you deal with that? And I think because well you you'll see here the puppeteers are playing puppets who have them um, in terms of character, but they don't become. A that we're doing here is. Um, and I, I did this in the adaptation. This was the way the adaptation was formulated. And, and one of the dramatic things that Roberto and I then had to figure out, did it work? And if so, how does it work? That um, in the relationship between actors and puppets, uh, we essentially have two different to each other. They're not in the same world. Uh, and so what defines this? And so, uh, you know, and why are some puppets and others not? And so essentially what we did was we took the five characters who are uh, in some way what we'd consider the family. 
the, the, the people who, who represent the, char the characters in this play who are interconnected. There are other characters in this play who further the plot, but who are not interconnected. And so for me, dramaturgically, they actually don't need to be characters. They are, they are uh, forces that act on this central grouping of characters. And I think you'll see that really clearly in some of the scenes. Jen, can we go? And then one of the things that I find amusing in this, in this experience is, is the fact that you have to sort of, the actor has to become neutral in order to be able to go through the puppet. Uh, but a neutral that is not uh, an effacement of, of what you are. And uh, of course, this is incredibly difficult in Central America and Mexico, where we're t the tendency to melodrama is extremely strong. And we are all very melodramatic. And so we had a very hard time doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. This should work. <laughs>
costumes and puppets were by Enos uh, Zelabasu. <laughs> Music, Scott Ainsley, yeah. So where is this headed next? Well, we're going on tour to Honduras in October, mm. and we're trying to get a tour organized in the States. Mm. Latino communities. Uh, right now, we're working on the New York and the Washington area. But the idea is not to bring only this play, but to bring this play along with four other Salvadoran playwrights productions. But it involves 20 people, so it's, it's a, a dream. Of, a lot of cats to herd. Um, is there particularly Salvadorian elements, the, uh, particularly the costumes, might be lost on, on audiences that don't know about this, and how will you give that context to people? No. Okay. Um, questions from people? Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Since Eric put so much work into the English translation, is there a chance to see it in English as well? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, this, sure. this production, just, it belongs to Teatro Luis Poma. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the reason why I was asking is because Lessing is not really a known um, component in the U.S. Completely unknown. Yeah, and I always loved his, his work, and so I thought it would be very nice to get a chance. F. Murray Abraham's doing it at CSC in New York this season. It's like yeah. nationwide. Hmm. Really? Yeah. yeah. But I have to say that one of our challenges in It's, uh, I think the play as written for a contemporary with a, uh, an embarrassing melodramatic ending. And that, you know, all of a sudden everybody's related. Oh, God, that's so nice, you know? And so, so uh, I think the puppets help figure out how to make it playful without uh, without losing the, the the truth of it, right? Mm -hmm. That, I mean, doing a play with a message and telling everybody it's a message, I mean, this is this is really kind of embarrassing. I and think. recognition scenes just uh, bring forth laughter. Now, yeah. when in the 19th century, people would actually faint in the audience mm -hmm. because it was such a standard thing to yeah. the, the lost child. Still add something, being one of the of the inside, uh, as you can see from the picture, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, what I really felt was very interesting for us is that the philosophy of the play was for us to use as the philosophy of the the team playing it, <laughs> because with the the technique of, of, I would say, I say sunglass theater, or what they offered us, we really had to put away all our differences and all our different way of being, of acting, or anything, to be able to create together life mm -hmm. to the puppet. Because as in the play, we, we speak about the three uh, monotheist religions, <laughs> When we are three to give life to, uh, to one being, like the character of the puppet, uh, we have really to breathe together to be one. And that was really interesting. We had to work a lot on ourselves, and I guess oh, everybody who works in this kind of technique has to, even more than when you build a play, what you generally have to, to try to to understand each other, but there it was so much stronger to give life to one of the characters between three 
so different persons, you know, when you when you have to be part of the body. Yeah. And so I, I thought really it was interesting to have this philosophy of the play in the team who is giving life to the right. play. In the staging, I think just to expand on that, I, I think that the staging by necessity creates a non-hierarchical society, right? So Nara, Nara is, is, is Nathan, you know, she gets to do the F. Murray Abraham moment, you know, and, and, you know, and then the next moment she's on the feet of a puppet. Uh, and, and uh, you know, a character playing, uh, you, you, know, uh, you know, dressed as a, uh, as a high level politician, you know, you know, comes out and commands the stage with his character one moment, the next moment he's on the feet of a puppet. And this is, it's fluidly changing from one to another and everyone, uh, I mean, metaphorically, as well as physically, everybody's willing to take the feet of somebody else. You know, I mean, it's it's. I mean, I think that that, from the puppet perspective, that's that is the ultimate non-hierarchical society. You know, how can I help you walk? So, I mean, that, and that's what happens. Yeah. Could you guys t talk about? Um, your long relationship together, how long, how much work you've done, how to where we started today. Well, I first saw Sunglass when they, uh, when they performed in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, I was very taken by, uh, I don't know if it was Invitation to Heaven or Sand, I can never remember that. To me, the place is mixed. <laughs> very impressed by the work and uh, and then uh, I think Eric was at the time looking for somebody to to direct him in a, sort of a very crazy project that he had uh, with improvisations with puppets and so we tried that and we performed that uh, a couple of times and that one failed miserably but it led to better things right and it was it was a horrible show <laughs> <laughs> Because, because you can't you can't really improvise. You can, but you you can, you have to make them as you go along, right? Of course you can, but not not the way the way we had we had set out to do. So this led to something else, which was a fantastic project, which was uh, One Way Street, uh, an evocation of Walter Benjamin, which to me is one of the most beautiful shows I've ever done. And it was uh, not only a fantastic, life-changing experience for me discovering Walter Benjamin and Hannah Arendt and Sholem, uh, Gershom Sholem, and um, and their writings and what what this means in the world today, and uh, that that was a beautiful show which had a great career. In in a memorable place yeah. in the show. I mean, I think that the, uh, can thank the um, Salvadoran Civil War for having met Roberto and Nara because, uh, because you were basically in exile for 12 years in, in Geneva. I mean, from 25 years. 25 years. Mm -hmm. There, so. Uh, so thank you, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> It's not something we've heard a lot huh, during this <laughs> festival. <laughs> I was being ironic. Any other? Any other? <laughs> uh, it was totally ironic. Please, I'd like <laughs> no, to put that out on record. <laughs> that's fine. Can you talk about some of the um, um, evidences of the violence that you saw while you were down um, there creating, and, and how that made you feel? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the the. Uh, Several of them that impacted uh, we were coming we were actually coming back from dinner one night, and Roberto got a call from one of his good friends to ask if we were all right, and we didn't know why he was asking that, and uh, you know someone had thrown a grenade into a, a hotel in the neighborhood. Hmm. Um, we were down there. Uh, when uh, the gangs gave, a, gave an ultimatum that there was going to be a curfew and we were in the middle of rehearsal and all of a sudden the 
stop and they're all looking and Roberto looks up and says, what's going on? I said, it's, it's after time. We need, to, we need to get home before the gang curfew. And Roberto says, oh, oh, right, right. Got to pack up quick. We're gone, you know, got to get home. And, and um, you know, and then there was well, just- Well, we lost one, one of the uh, finest members of the, uh, of the first workshop who was going to be in the play because half the time he couldn't make it to the, uh, to, workshop. The, to the workshop because he lives in a gang infested area where he has to ask permission to, to leave the neighborhood. And you know, they said no that day. And the next day they said no, and uh, you know, just call and say, I can't come in, you know. It's a, there are things that are bigger than the theater, hmm. even if the show must go on. Hmm. Sometimes it can't. Yeah. And what was that like um, creating in, in, that, in that context? And I don't know, but it was, yeah. yeah. Louder. Louder. What? Ines needs to be louder. Oh. Ines needs to be louder. It was inspiring. <laughs> because it put everybody into a different focus. You really focused in a different way. Hmm. Because you, 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 your subconscious constantly was dealing with something that you tried to push in the background but kept keep on working but you couldn't fully get rid of it. Mm. it was, I, for me, it was very exciting. Mm. Wow. I always find it a terrible thought to think that great art has always been produced under times of great censorship. But, uh, mm. <laughs> you know, uh, great mm. art does, does get born around very difficult situations. Mm. I mean, I think we, I, I guess I would just say we were, we were very aware that, uh, that every day we would wake up and look at the news to see how many people had been killed that, that day and, and who they were. A doctor, not a gang member. And, and so we would have to say why. Place, there was some connection to the gangs, uh, you know. And one day it was say why why this, but you know, there's always this question of are, why is it those people? You know, what's the connection? Is is it random? Hmm. Is this accident? You know, is this totally random and anybody could go out at any time, or or, or Uh, and that question, I think, was always, always with us so that we could just try and understand uh, where we stood. I, I, did you, do you agree with that? And the great tragedy of Salvador is that, you know, uh, uh, an exodus uh, of people during the war and after the war, and uh, now uh, it's uh, a country that is As one editorialist who I despise <coughs> said, uh, but I think it was very clear, uh, so I'll quote him. He said, in Salvador, even death is, has class consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because it's basically, it's, it's poor young men who are getting killed. That's the over. We have a question here. And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that in some ways it is the randomness that Eric was talking about. The perception is that it's random because you're not on the inside. You can't possibly know why somebody was targeted. And so it feels random. I think under those circumstances, sometimes petty differences disappear and people work together as a team because they're in the same boat. And it feels like that. Anybody because yeah. of the randomness, could yeah. not be able to make the next rehearsal. You just don't know. But just the question, is it random if, if a, gang, gang, a couple of gang members show up at your doorstep and say, we have singled out your house as a gang house, and you have to leave by tonight or we'll kill you? No, that's not 
but so, but it's see, but it's see, but their choice, right? It can be random. It can be random, right? Exactly. And so, from your point of view, if you don't know that there's there's a definitive reason behind you, you're being chosen, it feels random. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, yes. So, so that, but the but the people in the company, that, you know, Remy Ness is talking. I mean, I would think if you were working together on something, that whatever petty differences might have bothered you if you had been someplace else where that would would just fall away. I mean, you can't afford that. That's yeah. just a waste of effort. Well, I think sad, sadly, the petty differences are still very present in in the political world. Yeah. of Salvador, and Roberto has, has said to me that if the right and the left would stop arguing, would stop fighting each other, somebody might actually come up with a plan for the country. So. But not within the theater troupe, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. not, in, not in the country, that, that can happen, obviously. But within the troupe, yeah. maybe not the team. One more question, I think we have time for it. Yes, over here. You've talked about class as being the big dividing or splitting society up. What about gender? Well, it's a difficult question to answer because uh, the feminist society, and yet this is a society in which there are almost no fathers. The fathers are very absent. It's a, it's a society that is primarily uh, led by women. Uh, they are the breadwinners. They are, I mean, the, the, there are, uh, I don't know what the percentage of, of, of mothers who are the head of households without fathers is, but it's enormous. Uh, and this is, this is something inherited from uh, from the from the colonies and the conquest, uh, and um, so so in in very many on site, you would think it's almost a matriarchal society, but it isn't. And uh, gender equality, of course, there is there is not, but there there is much. Uh, politically, much more than than in the states. I mean, uh, all the countries in Latin America that have had women presidents, or they don't know what the big Hillary thing is about anyway. I mean, there's so many countries that have already had women presidents. Uh, Salvador is not a case in point because we have not. But um, but in in the in in the work field, uh, are women paid less than men? Yes. I mean, I think it's it, the, the inequalities are still there. And, uh, and there's, there's a, a, in the past uh, three or four years, there's several laws that have been passed to protect, well, in the past 20 years, there's been a lot of laws protecting women and children. Like, for instance, uh, there's a law that uh, if a woman can prove her husband, the father of her children's alcoholism, she can actually uh, cash in his paycheck. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's the, uh, the uh, compulsory protection for, for children in which uh, um, a father who does not and whose paternity is proved, uh, the mother can have his salary uh, taken from his paycheck before he gets his paycheck, and th these sort of these sort of things. There's a there's a an anti feminicidio. How do you say that? Uh, murder of women. What do you call that in English? Misogyny, maybe. Hmm? Misogyny, perhaps. I don't know the Isn't term. Defined? In Spanish, it's it's the killing of women, mm -hmm. the murder of women. Matricide. Sounds like mothers to me. Uh, uh, um, it, there's a law against difficult application, but there are, I mean, institutionally there are things moving, but there is no equality. There, there is still a lot of derecho de tierra. Yeah, um, I don't know how you say it. Uh, right. Uh, 
I don't know how to say it in French. I don't know how to say the it in The men thinking that the, the it's men, many, uh, women, they had the right to have uh, imposed oh, yes. sexual relations mm -hmm. just because they are a male and a female. Mm -hmm. we're, we're out of time, and I want to thank Eric and Roberto and all of you. Thank you for being here.